The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the most famous defeat in American history. They not only were wiped out, uh, their bodies were put in a pile and burned to the ground. But what happened afterwards? The message the Texians got were revenge, avenge. Fox and Friends host Brian Kilmeade remembers the Alamo Avengers. It's a Texas story, but it's our story too. And the men who became legends. They're not perfect, but man, they fought in a way I wish I could fight with that much courage. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. Get out and vote. If you're living in one of the five states holding elections today, here in our home state of Virginia, the results could have national consequences. Will the outcome be a bellwether for 19, oh, excuse me, for 2020 election? And why have billionaires like George Soros poured money into the Democratic races here? Gary Lane has the answers. Voters in Louisiana, Mississippi, Kentucky, New Jersey, and Virginia are making their choices for state and local offices. Virginia, a reliable Republican state for 50 years, is now leaning blue. And what happens here could be a bellwether for next year's general election. Donald Trump lost the state to Hillary Clinton by 5% in 2016. The state assembly is almost evenly split. Republicans hold a one-seat majority in both the House and the Senate. Todd Gilbert is Virginia House of Delegates Majority Leader. He says outsiders have spent big money in hopes of changing the balance of power in the Commonwealth. The amount of money coming in, mostly from uh, the Democratic side, uh, billionaires like George Soros and Tom Steyer, the environmentalist, and Michael Bloomberg, all pouring millions of dollars into Virginia races uh, to try and reshape our state and, and ultimately reshape the country. One week before Election Day, more than $82 million had been spent, making this the most expensive election in Virginia history. And perhaps more than a bellwether, this vote could test Democrat voter enthusiasm, following a blackface scandal for Governor Ralph Northam and sexual assault allegations against Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax. Caitlin Conant is political director for CBS News. I think it's a sign of just enthusiasm and how much voters are fired up and ready to get out there. And I think Democrats are trying to go down ballot. We saw them make efforts in Wisconsin in the midterms, and they're really hoping to make some gains in the state legislatures. Gun control and health care are the top issues for Virginia Democrats. The Cato Institute's Michael Cannon. Republicans just don't do health care. This has never been one of their strong suits, and it's a real and decades-long problem. It's one of the reasons we got the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare is because Republicans have paid insufficient attention to this issue. A large turnout of pro-life voters may make a difference to keep red or purple states from turning blue. Many Virginians were outraged when Democrat Governor Ralph Northam appeared on the radio advocating infanticide. Vice President Mike Pence raised the abortion issue at get-out-the-vote rallies in Virginia and Kentucky. At a time when leading Democrats advocate late-term abortion and defend infanticide, I promise you, this president, this vice president, and your governor will always stand for the right to life. Pence and the president will be watching the Virginia race closely. It's a key southern state. What happens here could make a big difference not only for Virginians, but for Donald Trump's re-election chances in 2020. Gary Lane, CBN News. The CBN News political correspondent David uh, Brody is joining us now. And David, uh, what do you think it's going to mean for the president if the uh, Democrats take Virginia? They, of course, they pretty much got it, but the legislature is still in the hands of the Republicans. Well, let's start with this, Pat. Uh, first of all, Virginia, obviously a big deal on Tuesday. There's no doubt about it. Now, for the president, we need to take a step back here. And let's remember, President Trump is not on the ballot. So in a way, it's good news for the president, even if it goes south uh, in Virginia, so to speak, in terms of Democrats winning. Trump can say, look, I'm not on the ballot. And that does make a difference. It's true. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we need to watch for enthusiasm tonight, especially in that Loudoun County. Uh, as you get into some of those Washington, D.C. suburbs that are very anti-Trump, does the enthusiasm uh, carry on uh, up in that area? I think that's what we're going to be looking for. Look, uh, 
Uh, about 30 to 35 percent or so of Virginia voters uh, typically come to the polls in an off-year election like that. Uh, that's of 70 percent. That means 70 percent of registra- registered voters are not even coming to the polls. So about 30, 35 percent. If you if if the number is north of 35 percent, that's a very good turnout, and that's bad news for the Republicans. So we wait to watch, uh, especially on the enthusiasm aspect of the, all of this. Well, you know, I have never seen this kind of money before. In the history of Virginia, I mean, this is an off-year election, and the money is pouring in from Soros and Steyer, and Michael Bloomberg is coming into Virginia with, and they're spending millions of dollars. Uh, what do you think? We're, we're now one year away from the 2020 presidential mm-hmm. election, and three months uh, from the, the uh, uh, well, what's coming up in, in the next election? So. Uh, do you think Biden is going to keep his his lead in the Democrats? Do you think uh, uh, he's he's history? Well, Biden is on thin ice big time, and here's the number one reason: Joe Biden. I mean, he's his own worst enemy. Uh, and then after that, Elizabeth Warren's a very close second. She's done well. And then you throw in the Ukraine situation, uh, and that's been a problem for Biden as well. And why is that? Well, because, look, when you talk about the Ukraine situation, here's what people in middle America think. Old school politician, conflict of interest, bringing his son on board. We don't want any of that. And that's why Donald Trump was elected in the first place, because he wasn't one of those old school politicians. So I think it hurts Biden. But once again, back to Elizabeth Warren. She, she's the one to watch here. Uh, and I got to tell you, some of these polls that we've seen just recently, and, you know, I'm not a huge fan of, of polls, especially this early out, but... This New York Times poll is very interesting because it actually shows that none of the Democrats, Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Buttigieg, none of them have been able to really flip any sort of Obama district that went for Trump. In other words, these are districts that went for Trump that used to be Obama districts. They haven't been able to make any headway in these districts. That's good news for Donald Trump coming up in 2020. Well, Trump apparently is leading uh, in these swing states. I mean, we're talking mm-hmm. about, well, I don't know, but Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, those mm-hmm. states that, that carried the, the day for him. Uh, are they going to hold, do you think, for the president in 2020? Well, so far, the empirical data shows that, yes, as a matter of fact, in this New York Times poll, he is not only just doing just as well in many of these swing states, he's actually doing better in some of the swing states that he lost. So in other words, electorally at least, if the election were held today, the polls are suggesting that Trump could actually win by an even bigger margin. And this has been the concern all along by some Democrat activists that I've been talking to, some strategists. Uh, They are concerned about a roaring economy, about a Donald Trump who knows how to brand an opponent. I mean, look at what's going on with uh, impeachment right now. You know, the Democrats are trying to figure out what the one line of impeachment is for this. It's very confusing. Donald Trump has one line, read the transcript. It's the make America made again, make America great again. And now here we go. Read the transcript. As a matter of fact, in Kentucky uh, Monday night, there were a lot of folks, a lot of supporters behind him with the read the transcript T-shirt. He's able to make it very simple. And that's a problem for Democrats going forward. David, my prediction has been all along that the uh, Democrats in the House don't have the guts to take an up or down vote on impeachment. There's all this talk and all these uh, uh, hearings and all this stuff, but when it comes down to the final vote, I don't think they're gonna do it. What do you think? Well, I tell you what, there is a school of thought, Pat, for sure about that, and there's a lot of reasons for it. Number one, they might have a timing problem just to begin with. Look, I'm looking at the uh, week of December 16th. That's the week before Christmas, obviously, uh, and the week before Congress gets out of there. They're going to have to take a vote that week. Uh, There's no doubt about it. If they don't, then you run the risk going into January, and then... You have voters scratching their heads. They're already scratching their heads. But in January of 2020, an actual election year, they say, why in the world are we impeaching a president when in 10 months we can decide whether or not we want to vote him out of office anyhow? So, you know, there's all sorts of political problems for Democrats to do this. Uh, And and it is true, Pat, that eventually some of these... uh, some of these swing districts that we've been seeing, uh, you, you just wonder if that vote will ever come to fruition. And part of the problem here isn't just timing, but what 
will the Democrats' actual articles of impeachment be? They think they have so much material to work with, that could actually be a problem because they're not going to be able to necessarily hone it down into some sort of coherent, final, connect-the-dot strategy. Because, Pat, i got to tell you, they may think there's a lot of dots around Trump right now, but what's the connector? They have not been able to connect these dots specifically, and that's a big problem. David, thank you so much. We look forward to your analysis as we get closer to the election. David Brody. Well, in other news, a deadly plot to blow a synagogue to smithereens foiled by the FBI. Ephraim Graham has this story and more from the CBN Newsroom. Pat, a Colorado man is in custody for plotting to bomb a synagogue. He is accused of posting messages of hate online and wanting to start a race war by bombing Temple Emanuel in Pueblo. FBI agents posing as white supremacists met with him, bringing pipe bombs and sticks of dynamite. The suspect reportedly saying, quote, this is absolutely gorgeous as he examined them. According to the complaint affidavit, Mr. Holzer self-identifies as a skinhead and a white supremacist. Mr. Holzer went on to suggest to undercover agents that they use explosive devices to destroy the synagogue and, quote, get that place off the map. Mr. Holzer also stated that he was not concerned about any loss of life from the attack because such victims would be Jews. Authorities consider the case domestic terrorism and a hate crime. The U.S. is officially pulling out of the Paris Climate Accords. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo submitted the formal notice to the United Nations Monday, beginning a year-long process. Pompeo said the deal is unfair economic burden to the U.S. economy. The U.S. signed on to the 2015 Paris Accords under the Obama administration. It requires nations to set goals for cutting back on carbon emissions, which are blamed for global warming. The U.S. is the first of 200 signatories to break away from the deal. Pat? Well, you know, the great polluters, frankly, are the uh, Soviet Union and China. China has more pollution than you could imagine. I've been over there so bad that you could hardly breathe. On a Sunday, it was so bad you could hardly breathe. And Beijing is just a mess. So they aren't in this climate accord. So what we're doing, and Trump said exactly right, that all that this is a bureaucratic move to lower the influence of the United States, period. And this is not a good thing for America. Of course, we're going to do everything we can to limit climate uh, pollution. And we have been moving toward natural gas and other uh, uh, well, means of, uh, of energy that are less polluting. The United States has taken giant steps in the private sector to do that. But why should we cripple our economy when these other guys aren't moving theirs? And I think that's the big, big thing right now. Well, there's something else we've been talking about here. We've done a show called A Nation of Criminals. We have more people, ladies and gentlemen, incarcerated in America than, than, than Russia and China combined. I mean, it is horrible. In the so-called land of the free, we have thousands of laws that put people behind bars. It is a crazy thing. Well, there's a good news coming out of Oklahoma, Ephraim. Pat, in a move hailed as a giant step in criminal justice reform, Oklahoma commuted the sentences of hundreds of nonviolent offenders. More than 400 prisoners were released in the largest single mass commutation in the country's history. A law signed early this year retroactively reduced sentences for those who committed low-level crimes leading to the release. The commutation will save taxpayers about $12 million. Pat? Uh, I would question that number. I think it's closer to $12 billion that's going to save them because uh, locking people up each year, what is it, what is it going to cost, the $50,000 to send somebody to prison? Well, and for some of these crimes, they're really oh. low-level. Well, it's insane. I mean, you know, somebody's got a couple of uh, uh, joints of marijuana and they put him in jail for t 10 years, 15 years. I mean, they're just insane, some of those penalties. And we were so-called, if you weren't tough on crime, you couldn't get elected. Well, it's high time we open our eyes and say, look, this is crazy. And especially when these agencies put in these uh, draconian penalties. You know, it's one thing if the federal government has federal laws, but the agency laws with, with criminal sanctions are just proliferating. There's several hundred thousand laws. And um, I, we have 
a very excellent professor at Regent University, Jim Dwayne, who's a Harvard guy, and he wrote a book. He said, you know, always plead the fifth. Whatever they ask you, don't answer any questions. You know, I plead the fifth. Of course, you incriminate yourself. There's always some law that you may be breaking. So, so don't get hung up in the bureaucratic uh, Amazed. <laughs> Anyhow, what do you what else you got? Well, coming up later, shooting pain in her right shoulder. She couldn't bend her arm, couldn't even dress herself. So how did this woman get totally healed without seeing a doctor? But first, remember the Alamo? Brian Kilmeade does. What's the story behind the Texas fight for freedom? Find out after this. Remember the Alamo. It's one of the most stirring battle cries in history. 182 men were viciously slaughtered, but the story doesn't end there. What happened next? That's what Fox and Friends host Brian Kilmeade talked about with CBN's Caitlin Burke. We all remember the Alamo, but that defeat wasn't the end of the story. In his latest book, Fox News' Brian Kilmeade brings us the story of a small band of underdog Texans who came together to avenge the Alamo, and in the process, changed American history. In 1836, Texas belonged to Mexico, but American settlers were flooding the territory, lured by cheap farmland and the idea of a new life out west. They included Sam Houston, a protege of President Andrew Jackson, in Sam Houston and the Alamo Avengers, Kilmeade points out that upon his arrival, Houston discovered much more than personal opportunity. When he gets there, he sees there's a, there's a country, there's an area ripe for revolution. All the groundwork was laid for him to make this country, make this uh, area its own country, with the also ultimate uh, goal being part of our country. These Texians, as they were called back then, came seeking liberty and freedom. But that wasn't the vision of Santa Ana, Mexico's president. When it came to Texas, who wanted to do their own thing, they said, hey, we'll do our own thing. We'll be part of Mexico, this new country. Just let us alone. And they came back, no, we're raising your taxes. You're going to go by our rules. We're going to take back our cannons and our protection. And they said, have you met us? We're not going to really do that. You can't give someone freedom and then take it away and not expect the fight of your life. The Texas Rebellion started strong, with American settlers winning several small battles and even capturing the Alamo. In trying to hold the Alamo, they faced a crushing defeat by the Mexican army. Ultimately, 182 against 3,000 troops. Uh, they not only were wiped out, uh, their bodies were put in a pile and burned to the ground. And the message was, if you fight us, we're going to go for total annihilation. But the message the Texians got were, revenge. Avenge. So in the book you write, many of the dead had been imperfect, yet by dying they became heroes. Why is that important to note? The main thing in the back of my head, Caitlin, was the pushback I'm getting on so many of my history books that we're elevated these people in our school district, in our school curriculum, to mythical, fa uh, uh, mythical proportions that invites the criticism. And I thought, I'm going to tell you they're not perfect, but man, they fought in a way I wish I could fight with that much courage. That courage inspired the remaining Texas Army to pursue quick revenge. Sam Houston, however, wanted to win the war and knew fighting too soon could risk everything. He has to tell a bunch of Texians to do something they were told not to do, and that's retreat. To go the runaway scrape and pull back and train, pull back and train, and people uh, questioned his integrity, questioned his courage, uh, the willingness to fight. He ordered his underdog army to retreat avoiding Santa Ana's army for nearly six weeks. This bought time for Houston and his men to grow together, gain experience, and learn military tactics. The strategy paid off. The two armies finally met on April 21st, 1836 at San Jacinto. Houston's 800 men faced an enemy of more like 1,500. In his book, Kilmeade describes how Houston caught the Mexican army off guard, with the Texians charging under the war cry, Remember the Alamo. The victory was theirs in only 18 minutes. I realize this is really an American story. It's a Texas story, but it's our story too. The Alamo is the battle we remember, but it was actually the battle at San Jacinto that secured Texas her independence. 
ultimately making it possible for the Republic of Texas to become a part of the great American story. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, New York City. Uh, this is an interesting book. It's called the Sam Houston, the Alamo Avengers. And there's a nice big city in Texas named mm -hmm. after Mr. General Absolutely. Houston, Houston, Texas. There have been some wonderful history books yeah. that have come out of the anchors well, and the talents. You know, the, the one thing that they don't mention is that what happened in Goliad, which was after the uh, Alamo, when they, the Mexicans uh, captured a number of, uh, of officers or, and fighting men and massacred them at Goliad. It was just a slaughter and that. So it, it added to the horror that these people were facing under Santa Ana. And the uh, San Jacinto fabulous battle, a great book. Uh, Brian does a good job. And this is another one. It's very, very interesting. Sam Houston and the Alamo Avengers. Terry. Well, still ahead, Mike Tomlin and his Pittsburgh Steelers. What are this NFL coach and his team doing to fight sex trafficking? Find out later on today's show. Plus, a woman is sidelined for 10 months by paralyzing pain, and she couldn't afford to see a doctor. So how did she get a hallelujah healing? You have to stay tuned to find out after this. Shooting pain in her right arm made it hard for Patty Bryant to do much of anything. She couldn't even dress herself. For months, Patty prayed to be healed, but she was also asking for much more. What was it? And how did it lead to a hallelujah healing? Gatlinburg, Tennessee local Patty Bryant stays busy running one of the country's largest ministries for single moms. But after pressure washing around the house one day in July 2018, she felt a shooting pain in her right shoulder that would sideline her for months. And I actually couldn't move my arm at all. It was like, like stiff. I couldn't bend it. It was very frustrating. And living on a limited income from the donations to her ministry, Patty couldn't afford health insurance. So she felt going to a doctor wasn't an option different things were happening, like the maneuvering of my fingers and my hands. They would drop. I kind of knew it had to do with my rotator cuff. I thought it would go away. And after six months, it didn't go away. As the months passed, Patty was losing her patience and her independence. I don't think I ever had an old mentality but when your body is not doing what it's supposed to do, like couldn't get dressed, like it would take me a while to put this on. I, f I felt very alone. There's no doubt about that. I felt very alone. Despite her doubts and frustrations, Patty still turned to the one person she knew she could count on. I was praying for a total healing to not just a healing of what I was before, but what I was many years ago. I never had any doubts. God was going to heal me in time. I knew he was going to do something. I just didn't know when. Then one afternoon, almost 10 months after her injury, Patty tuned in to the 700 Club, where a familiar voice said something that caught her attention. There's, there's somebody I, in the state of Tennessee. I, I think you've pulled a shoulder muscle, and uh, I, I, I don't know who, where, or what, but I believe God is healing you right now. So just raise your arm where the shoulder muscle, you couldn't work it and work it back and forth and you'll be completely healed. I got the most amazing peace in my body. And I knew it was the presence of the Holy Spirit. It was like, oh my gosh, I can move my shoulder, hallelujah. And it was instant. Wow, Lord, you're really hearing me. You're really listening to me. Thank you, Father. I called up my friends, and then I called up the 700 Club. I said, I just want you to know, I was the person in Tennessee, and God healed me instantly. Today, if you come through the Gatlinburg Mountains, you'll find Patty pain-free and as active as ever. And when she isn't helping others, she's pausing to give credit and praise to Jesus Christ. I know God brought me here for such a time as this. 
There's no pain. There's none. And I couldn't do this. Are you kidding me? And I can move my arm around and pick things up. He can do it for me. He could do it for anybody. And he will. You know, we rejoice with Patty and what God did for her. We hear these stories all the time. I wish you could hear all of them all of the time because it's very encouraging. You know, the Bible says when we gather together, when two or more gather, he's in the midst of us, that what we pray according to his will will be done. Well, it's God's will for you to be whole. It's yeah, not his exactly will for you to be it. ill. That's exactly We it. have some other answers to prayer here. Pat, this is Sheila. She lives in Meridian, Tennessee. She suffered with a lump in her leg. She was watching this program and one day she heard you pray there's a lump and I don't hear exactly where it is but right now it's going to be like fire going into that part of your body put your hand on that part of your body where the lump is in the name of Jesus we command that lump to disappear and after praying with you she was completely healed marvelous here's one more this is from uh, Carla who lives in Randleman North Carolina she suffered from bleeding mm. and cracked toes due to diabetes one day she you her Terry Somebody has a chronic condition. They're cracked. They're bleeding in the bottom between your toes. God's healing you. You're just going to see it oozing uh, dry up, and the skin's going to heal over. And guess what? Two days later, Carly called our prayer center to report that her feet were totally Hallelujah. healed. That's All right, wonderful. folks, we're going to pray for you. There's nothing impossible. We just believe God. And Terry and I are going to join together right now. So all we ask you to do is just believe God. Just receive it. You know, it says Abraham believed God and he was counted for righteousness. Just believe. Mm -hmm. Father, I join Jesus. with my dear sister and we believe God. Nothing is impossible with you. Oh, my. You, you, you've had a serious concussion. Uh, is it Maisie, Maisie, Mary, something? You've had a serious concussion, and just put your hand on your head right now, and God is healing the brain, healing your skull. It's all coming together, and the power of God just touched you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jesus. Terry. So someone else, you had a, you've had a blow to your face, like the whole bridge of your nose is shattered. God is he gonna heal those bones. They're just gonna come back together so supernaturally quickly, you're going to have relief from all of the swelling and the inability to breathe clearly as God just touches that fracture right now in Jesus' name. As a woman, you think uh, it, it feels like breast cancer and uh, you've been scared to even test it, but you've done some exploratory work and you found a couple of lumps. Uh, right now, just touch, touch that breast with your hand and the power of God will go into that part of your body and that whatever they, that is in their cancer or otherwise will be completely healed and that breast will be totally healed in Jesus' name. Amen. And someone else, you have yes. like a, an unbelievably dry mouth mm -hmm. all the time. It affects the way you're able to eat, the taste of your food. God's healing that for you right now. Your saliva is just going to begin to produce again and you're going to be back to where you were before. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Wherever you are, we'd love to hear from you, so please give us a call. Tell us what God has done in your life. It's so simple. Just pick up the phone, call in. If you want further prayer, we've got people on the phone who are real prayer warriors. They'll pray with you, they'll laugh with you, cry with you, whatever it is. 1-800-700-7000. Terry. Well, coming up later, your questions and some honest answers. Brittany says, my boyfriend and I are five months pregnant. Is it wrong to move in together? Stay tuned for Pat's answer. That's later on. Plus, going into the belly of the beast. Undercover heroes risk their lives to bust sex traffickers. And a whole football team has their backs. How did the Pittsburgh Steelers get a piece of this action? Well, that's next. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is setting new highs as the market rally moves into its fifth week. Monday, the Dow post passed its prior all-time high set in July. The Dow is up 18 percent this year. The S&P is up 23 percent and on track for its best performance since 2013. Analysts say consumer spending, a strong labor market, and signs of a cooling in the trade war with China are contributing factors.
Iran's president says it will begin injecting uranium gas into more than a thousand centrifuges. It's important because the centrifuges had been operating empty until now. And it's another step toward Iran producing enriched uranium and possibly work towards building nuclear weapons. Iran announced yesterday it's operating more than double the number of centrifuges allowed under the 2015 nuclear pact. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Well, we are excited to offer for the very first time ever Superbook Storybooks. We have actually two storybooks now available. The first Christmas Superbook helps Chris Joy and Gizmo discover the true meaning of Christmas. And in a giant adventure, Superbook takes our heroes to the battle where David meets the giant Goliath. Both make perfect Christmas gifts for all the children in your life. Great stocking stuffers, I might add. Order your copies today for a gift of only $6.99 each with free shipping and handling. All you have to do to get your copies is to call 1-800-700-7000, or you can do it by visiting CBN.com. Great hardcover, wipeable yeah. for greasy little <laughs> fingers. Be sure to order by December 14th if you want delivery in time for Christmas. But I, yesterday I showed these to a couple of my grandchildren, and they loved them. As they said, you know, the illustrations are just beautiful, beautiful in them. They were just... Great story time. So let us hear from you. Pat. This is a story that will touch your heart. Her husband abandoned her for another woman, and he left not only his wife, but their infant son as well. Still, that wasn't the worst of Luxem's problems. So what was the worst problem? Take a look. Four years ago, when Luxem's son was just a few months old, her husband left her for another woman. She now works as a tailor to provide for her son on her own. She earns good money when she can work, but she spends much of her day fetching water. The well is more than a mile from our home. I can only carry so much, so I have to go every day. I must divide my time between getting water, tailoring, cooking, cleaning, and getting my son ready for school. When CBN learned about the water problem in this small village, we dug a well that now everybody has easy access to. The well is so near our house, it's very convenient for me. Now Laxmi has enough time to work and spend time with her son. You are the reason for our happiness. We give a heartfelt thanks to everyone who helped us. Well, it's, isn't it wonderful we can help somebody like Laxmi? And she's one of many that are being helped. And, and how do we do it? Because you, you sitting at home, you're willing to write a check of $20 a month, every month. 65 cents a day is not a whole lot. Now I want to send you something as our gift of thanks. I was able to record some verses from Proverbs that have to do with wisdom, favor, and anointing. Wisdom, favor, and anointing. If you have those three, you've, got, you've just about got it all. And we'll send this to you as our gift. Just pick up the phone and call so you can count on me as a 700 Club member. I'm with you. So let's get some tough questions. Before that, I want to tell you what Betty in yeah. Pennsylvania had to say. She, she lives said? in Hanover, and she has listened to the CD. She said the Transforming Word CD is an excellent resource. It was great hearing the word read. That really is wonderful to hear yeah. it read to you. Yeah. Scripture came to life as Pat defined wisdom, favor, and anointing from the book of Proverbs. That's why we want you all to have it, because others have, have listened to it and Amen. found it such a okay, blessing. Go. Okay, well, up next, our most popular segment on YouTube, Your Questions, Honest Answers, Michael says, last week my wife shocked me at this when she said she wants our pastor to be her extra lover. Should I talk to him first before she tells him? Pat tells it like it is. It's coming up. But first, Pittsburgh's powerhouse off the field. Why the Steelers are joining the fight against sex trafficking. It's all coming up after this. Educators, doctors, lawyers, sex traffickers come from all walks of life. And one former CIA agent is determined to take them down. 
he goes straight into what's called the belly of the beast to bust them. And now the Pittsburgh Steelers have got his back. This is the fastest growing criminal enterprise on the planet. Uh, we work with law enforcement. We go undercover in this dark, dark world of child sex trafficking. It's a very difficult thing to recruit uh, people into this cause because it's so heavy. In a rare gesture, out came the heavy lifters. Tim Ballard, founder of Operation Underground Railroad, got some help when Pittsburgh Steelers head coach Mike Tomlin volunteered his NFL team to raise awareness for Tim's agency. All you have to do is be exposed to what Tim and company are doing at OUR, um, how significant the work is, how, how much needed the work is. I spent some time praying about it and thinking about it, but just thought it was worth our time to bring OUR out here and spend a couple days with us as a football team. God would take a hold of that. The relationship has grown. So has the profile of the four-year nonprofit. As a retired government agent, Tim formed a task force from among the best operatives. When Mike Tomlin came out and announced his, his partnership with us, he doesn't even realize how powerful that was to our team. Like, that's important psychologically for my guys to have that. It's been a healing for us. The Steelers are huge. There's this, this is, it's a, an enormous fan base and child sex slavery. This is something that's so dark that you need people of light to say it's okay to look at it. And people like Mike Tomlin and, and, and the Steelers organization can't think of a better partner. What makes Operation Underground Railroad unique? Our team is made up of, of specialists in rescue operations. Former Navy SEALs, former Special Ops, former CIA, former federal law enforcement. Guys who had a specialty in all of this. And then aftercare specialists who are gonna go in and make sure these kids have the healing they need. So, and, and we partner with those same agencies that we all retired from. We go right into the belly of it, child trafficking with a solution and liberate these kids. Would we be surprised to understand who these perpetrators are? The world would be shocked if they knew who these people were. I mean, two million children forced into the commercial sex trade. What kind of demand justifies that number? These are people of all walks of life. I've, I've arrested all of them. They're educators, they're, they're professionals, doctors, lawyers. This is sex addiction that, that drives this. Anybody is exposed to that evil if they let themselves go there. What drives you in this? My kids. I have seven children and whatever kid we're looking for out there in the world, when I look into that victim's eyes, I see my child's eyes. This is called empathy. Empathy, we should be praying for empathy. When God sees that you are willing to have empathy, even though it hurts a little bit, oh, he's there. He sends his power and you feel it. And there's almost this triangulation between yourself, that child victim, and the Lord. Does salvation and deliverance look different to you from the eyes of those kids? Oh, absolutely. At some of the brightest moments I've had moments of light have been in those dark places. It took me some time to realize what that was. It's the Spirit of God. And deliverance, the way we th think of it, it, it's more than just spiritual. I mean, it is physical. The Lord cares about that physical deliverance because the physical deliverance leads to the spiritual deliverance. You know, that's, what, that's why God cares about people in captivity, nations in captivity. Hey, Tim, that your hand? That's my hand. And the child? That's a child that we rescued. Uh, this is the pivotal moment. This is the connection. Mm. This is the part where we reassure mm. there is hope for your future. We're not going anywhere. Mm. We, we pulled you out of this, but we are staying with you until you become a survivor and a thriver in this world. Ops are ready. SWAT team's ready. What's the last thing you do before you go in? We always, always kneel in prayer. We have a Messianic Jew, former Navy SEAL, who just two weeks ago gave this amazing prayer in Hebrew. God, we know these kids are out there. When we get there, lead us to them. And this child, I mean, later came to us and she said, how did you find me? There was no hope. I know the answer is because God led us to you. We pray to find that one child who's in that dark corner of the most obscure nation on the planet. What has to be done to eliminate it? We believe that the enforcement of anti-trafficking laws will lead to the end of this. They've got to keep hitting it. It's this deterrent effect. Their captors are gone because the travelers, sex tourists, are now afraid to tour. The traffickers are now afraid to traffic. That's how you shut it down. 
well, why do people want this? It's pornography. It starts with pornography. It, it starts with, with an, an addiction that can't be met. It's about bringing you know, the principles of, of Christ's gospel to the world and, and letting that cleanse our society. Does it extend for you to have the capability of forgiving, even praying for those that you arrest? It does, it does. I mean, the, the, the grace of God is that powerful. And in that moment, you just want that person locked up because they don't, they've lost the privilege of participating in society. Then you do recognize that in some strange, almost incomprehensible way, they have become victimized by darkness through decisions they've made. And there is redemption for everybody. And so you do pray for that. I mean, we're, we're commanded to pray for that. We have to pray for that um, as part of the, the overall solution. God is the cause of liberty. It's horrible, and I, I appreciate those guys and the work they're doing, and, and the Coach Tomlin of the Pittsburgh Steelers, he's a terrific guy, but uh, it's time we recognize that this is, I mean, a million people are trafficked every year, a million, in Eastern Europe, in India, in South America, and the United States. It's slavery that exceeds anything that's your wildest imagination of horror. But God said, go out to those in, in captivity. All right, we got some questions. It's time for some questions right, and your answers. It. This is from Brittany who says, my boyfriend and I are five months pregnant. We want to move in together so we can share the experience and be together when the baby's born. Both of our parents frown upon this idea and say it is not biblical. I have no job, but we'll get one after the baby is born, and he has a very low-paying job, so we cannot afford to get married. Is it wrong to move in together even though we aren't married? I have seen unmarried Christians living together countless times. If it's wrong, why, if it is wrong, why is it wrong, and what do we do? Well, you know, as they, this whole saying is, two wrongs don't make a right. Yep. And look, here's the deal, you, you, if you, don't like what's going on, you can always kind of say, I'm leaving, goodbye. But if you get married and then you get divorced, all of a sudden it's a totally different scenario. And uh, you don't have a job that's adequate, your boyfriend doesn't, so you made a mistake. Why don't you get some adoption agency to take the baby and you two go your separate ways? Uh, you know, you, you want to move in together. Well, quote, my boyfriend and I are pregnant. He's not pregnant. You're pregnant. You know, it's, it's, it's your terminology is screwed up. But, hey, two wrongs that don't make a right. And, and you, I don't know how old you are, but you sound like you're just a youngster. And you, you're not capable of getting into marriage. You're not capable of raising a child. You don't have the time and the patience. And, all of a sudden, when the pressures of marriage and motherhood come upon you, you won't be able to handle it. Don't do it, all right? Mm -hmm. This is Michael Pat, who says, Dear Pat, I've been married to my wife for eight years, and we are very active in our local church. Last week, she shocked me when she said she wants our pastor to be her, quote, extra lover. This does not make any sense since I give her all the love and compassion that I can give. Our pastor does not know her plan. Should I talk to him first before she tells him? Oh, you'd better talk to somebody. That is the she weirdest thing. Psychological. Well, I, I think uh, I mean, uh, there's a sex uh, problem. Uh, <laughs> she has uh, been captured probably by some uh, demonic spirit. But what she's saying. She's married to you, has a successful marriage with you. You give her whatever she wants, but she wants a, quote, extra lover. Mm -hmm. Where does she get that concept? That is absolutely wrong. And she's active in her local church, so she well, obviously I mean, should she's, know it, that. I mean. Being active in a church really doesn't mean anything much. It just means you're active. It doesn't mean necessarily, you, you know, you're, you're given over to the Lord. You need to talk to that pastor. Mm -hmm. And you need to alert him to what's going on. And then you need to get that wife to some kind of counseling and deliverance because she, she's being captured by something that sounds extremely evil, all right? This is Sarah who says, Biblically, what is considered the age you become an adult? I know according to law in most states it's 18, the age where you can vote, participate in the lottery, buy tobacco products, etc. But according to the Bible, at what age do you become an adult? Well, you know, the... the uh, 
Jews have uh, a ceremony when the somebody... Bar mitzvah, yeah, bat mitzvah. Bar, bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah uh, when they're about 12 years old. But uh, my feeling is when somebody knows the difference between right and wrong, uh, that's when they become accountable before God. So if it, whether it's four or five or three or yeah. six or eight or whatever, that's the age, in my opinion, when, when they know the difference between right and wrong and they have a conscience that, you know, where they understand the rules. Without the law, there is no sin. So a little child doesn't, doesn't know right from wrong. But once they learn right from wrong, then at that moment they're accountable. But whether it's 12 years old or something like that, that that's, that's sort of arbitrary. All right. This is Larry who says, Jesus says, if any two agree, ask, and it will be granted. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be also. I'm shut in on oxygen 24-7 and watch CBN. Only one person ever comes around, and that's when I call needing groceries. Even then, this person only delivers and then leaves. My question is, do the hosts on TV count as the two or three gathered in his name, or do people need to be physically gathered together? I, I think they can be spiritually gathered together. I don't think they have to be physically. In the old days, it had to be physical, but uh, they didn't have television. They didn't have satellites. They didn't have all this other. So we kind of had a large group of prayer together, and uh, you could be in another country. So I, I don't think they have to be in the same room with you. And we'd be delighted to have you part of the fellowship. And we're praying together, especially if you have an infirmity, you can't go to church, all right? This is Frank who says, Dear Pat, you mentioned that when Satan fell, he took one third of the angels with him. Please explain this to me. Was there chaos in heaven? What was going on that caused Satan to take one third of the angels? Well, according to the Bible, there was a revolt in heaven mm -hmm. against God. And Satan uh, said, I can run things better than God. That's, the, that's the, the original sin. It's the sin of pride that says, I can do it better than God can do it. And Satan was the anointed cherub that covered. He was the greatest of God's creation. And he rebelled against God. And you look at uh, certain scriptures that talks about the fact that he took a third of the angels with him. And they are the so-called demons. They, they came to earth and they've been cut off from God, but they were following Satan. And what their desire right now is to destroy human beings that are made in the image of God. All right. mm -hmm. This is Jasmine. I'm currently living in a motel. I want to give up. I feel like God isn't listening to or answering my prayers. What should I do? I think what you've got to do is to begin to read the Word and let it take hold of you. Read, just take a couple of verses that will stand out. You might have one of those little packs of promises. Mm -hmm. But take one of the promises and say it over and over again until it becomes part of you. And take another one and then begin to declare. Let it get into your mind and then speak the Word. A man shall eat good by the fruit of his lips. So stop confessing negative. Stop confessing that you can't make it. Stop confessing that you're a failure. But begin to, this is the day the Lord hath made. I am more than a conqueror through him that loved me. And begin to, to speak those words. And you'll find something is beginning to change all the way around you. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Psalm 82. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Tomorrow is medicine going to the dogs. What can Dr. Dogs do to help people heal? You'll find that interesting, all of you dog lovers. <laughs> of which you are one. Which I, I are one. I will see you tomorrow. God bless you. Bye-bye. <laughs>